Hello and welcome. We'll get started in just a moment. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the Gray Decision Intelligence Demand Trend Webinar designed specifically for community college professionals. A few housekeeping items to get started with. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a place labeled Q&A. Please feel free to add your questions there. We'll get to as many as we can during the session, and we'll certainly follow up later with you if we run out of time. My great colleagues and I will be available for chat as well during the duration of the session. You will receive a link to the webinar recording and the presentation slides in the next few days. Please look for it in your email. And now, without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Pete Starrett. Thank you, Marianne. And welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Pete Starrett, an EVP at Great Decision Intelligence, and we'll be walking you through today's webinar. Today, we'll, we'll cover much like past webinars that we do monthly for community colleges, a uh, very similar agenda. We'll first touch on what is a program evaluation system, which is a product we've compiled, and a lot of this you already have internally to, to be able to develop some of this on your own. Um, or work with uh, an outside firm. We'll then touch on a specific piece of that, which is student demand and look at trends in the market uh, in terms of student demand trends. And we'll talk about what those sources are. Then we'll jump to employment and look at some of the trends in employment. And then today's special section that we'll cover is a, a look back at some emerging programs we've covered in the past and looking at where they are now. And this is really uh, a, a sort of a teaser and a buildup to a webinar we run every January that looks at uh, emerging programs in, the, in higher education that don't really show up in the data. And we'll get into what those are and, and how you can register for next year's. And then finally, we'll summarize. So first off, what is a program evaluation system or as we refer to it as uh, PES? And it's a system that enables you to evaluate and manage programs, which drive to increasing revenue and reducing costs at the institution. And so first and the first piece in all of this is, is looking at the mission of the institution and how programs fit within that mission. And this is critical to keep in mind as you're, you're evaluating your program portfolio, whether it be new programs or current programs that you're offering today. It is more qualitative than quantitative. And so uh, it's, it's just very important to be mindful not to exclude it as you're uh, assessing all of the data that you will have at your fingertips because this won't be a metric that you're able to track. Second, you need to keep track of academic performance. This would include metrics like DFW rates, graduation rates, uh, number of students who passed certain uh, exams like the, the NCLEX for nursing, uh, and any number of other academic outcomes metrics that you're able to track and probably do have in, uh, built into your internal systems today. Next, it's also necessary to understand the external market demand for programs. So this is where you'll be able to identify uh, opportunities to grow by identifying programs with high student demand, strong employment opportunities, uh, and where the market's not saturated competitively. You'll especially need this data to identify potential new programs to launch because other categories like the academic outcomes and the margins we'll look at next won't exist for, for new programs. So you're really reliant on what does the external market look like for those. But it is an important part of evaluating the uh, potential changes to current programs in terms of identifying growth opportunities or by, you know, identifying programs or flagging programs that might have hit their reach their maximum, uh, especially if they're declining and understanding is that a market decline or an internal decline. Lastly, is to look at program margins. And this is not to say that all programs need to make a large program uh, profit. Uh, but there do need to be high margin programs to subsidize those programs that uh, are critical to the mission, which we identified in that first piece of information, uh, that might be closer to break even or below. 
Uh, so it's really important to, to understand the margins of programs and identify those opportunities so that we're not running all our programs at a break even, for example, when there are other costs that the institution obviously has uh, across the board in terms of overheads all the way up through the president's office. And going a step further, this is also where you can identify efficiency opportunities within programs using information like cost per student credit hour, fill rates, and much, much more. Uh, and then really in order to make decisions with all this information, you need to engage the right team across the institution. You need to provide them with the right information, which is the information we just talked about. And finally, you need a good process to evaluate programs and make decisions. And this is where having the right people and the right information uh, is, is very important and critical towards arriving at programmatic decisions. And then finally, uh, and this is, is often forgotten or missing more than you think, um, in that uh, it, you need to manage this on an ongoing basis. Uh, it's, you know, they're I'm not saying this is true for all institutions, but there are a lot of instances we're aware of where this, this process tends to wait until accreditation reviews uh, are up or an issue arises. And so it's, it's really important to constantly track the information mentioned in a program evaluation system to identify where there are opportunities to grow and therefore increase revenue or to flag areas of concern that should be monitored or adjusted or whatever it may be. Um, it's just, it's, it's a very important final sort of part of this process is that the process should continue, not end once you've come to decisions on uh, maybe this year, you know, what your priorities will be, but you need to continuously uh, make adjustments as needed and identify where those opportunities are. So with that, today we'll be covering information from the, the markets part of a program evaluation system. Uh, and specifically within, uh, we, you know, we track four broad categories of student demand, employment, competitive intensity, and degree fit. Today we'll be looking at student demand and employment and some specific subsets of the sources of data included in those specific categories. First up, we'll touch on student demand. And here we track several sources of information. Uh, we're not sharing the iPads data today because that only changes once a year. Uh, and we updated that a couple months ago on a webinar. So if you want to see those results that there should be recordings and materials from that from uh, a couple months ago, I believe was when we covered that. Um, but that's kind of your sort of your, your final stage of the funnel as you think about student demand in that that's reporting when students complete a program. And so depending on whether it's a certificate or an associates, they could have started anywhere from one to two to three years ago, depending on how long it takes um, in terms of when they started that program. And it's a bit dated in that we only have through 2023 now uh, is what was updated in the 2024 calendar year. Uh, but what we do have information and we'll be updating today are uh, enrollment we have from National Student Clearinghouse where this updates three times per year. And we do have some updates on total enrollment today. And then we have Google search volumes that we track and we update this monthly and we'll share those trends for the most recent month. And then finally not mentioned here, but we'll also share some trends on the, uh, or in course era enrollments just in terms of what's popping out there to give you some ideas of, of what students are looking for. So with that, we'll start with our, our sort of more current in terms of what students are looking for today, uh, student demand source, and that's Google searches. And we track uh, Google search volumes for over 900 programs, which covers 90% of all completions in the United States. And you'll see in these charts here, we've got three years of data, uh, all shown for each of the, the months of the year. So we're looking at, you can see uh, the middle bars here, the darkest bar is 2023. And so that's what we're comparing to year over year when we look at these numbers. And then we have bars for 2024 shown in the, the light shade of blue and 2022 showed in, shown in that very light gray shade. And if we look at this year, we see that, or this past month, I should say, in terms of the most complete month we now have, the Google search volumes are up 64% year over year. And this really continues a trend that we've seen in the past few months where 
uh, for whatever reason, Google search volumes are much higher in these past four months or so compared to the same four months in 2023. So there's clearly an uptick in Google search volumes over the most recent four months. And even if we look back to earlier this year, all the numbers are beating 2023 and 2022 levels. So in terms of student interest, it's clearly there. What's driving that? This doesn't tell us. Uh, I mean, and there's obviously a lot of uh, states. I'm in Massachusetts, so I know there have been changes to add free community college, which could be driving more students to look uh, and search for specific programs. Um, but this is certainly a huge uptick in, in terms of the volumes that we're seeing. And then we look at the cost per click and the average is up 9% this month. It was almost flat last month and down the month before. So not a great sign um, seeing that it's up year over year, which could indicate that it is becoming a little more competitive marketing for certain programs. Um, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind as you're thinking about your marketing costs that again, this is one month. So, and, and if we look at last year, there was, is actually a dip in the, uh, October, 2023 number. So I wouldn't be too concerned in that this is down slightly from the, the overall costs in September. Um, but certainly something that is really something you need to keep in mind as you think about what it takes to market for these programs, even with the increase in volumes that we're seeing. Um, it's clearly not run through in terms of decreasing the the costs per click for um, what it takes to market for these particular keywords that we're tracking by program. And now finally, and again, this is, you know, this and some of the other charts should be helpful materials for you to think about as you are looking at your, your current program portfolio and what it is you are offering today. Um, and, and making sure you're keeping up with whatever the, the recent trends are. And here we're looking at a chart that shows the fastest growing programs based on Google search volumes. Uh, and this is the year over year unit change in October 2024 compared to 2023. And so we see that uh, in terms of the, the ones we see on the list here, um, the 10 that we're showing, Four of them are in health. We've got three in business, two in education, and then one at the bottom, which is a, a new one from, from last month, is barbering, which is an interesting one to show up on the list today. But you can see we've got business at the top, and, and some of these probably aren't surprising in that they're, they're very large programs as well, not just growing um, much faster than others, but they are already large to begin with, which is what's driving a bigger unit change. Um, so that's where it's important to, you know, if these are programs you're not offering, which uh, too many community colleges out there are, this is certainly a list of programs that are worth considering. And we've got business administration, medical billing and coding, nursing assistant slash patient care aid, uh, general education, zip code, human resource management, marketing, diagnostic medical, sonography, early childhood ed, psychology and barbering. And those bottom ones are different from last month in that we didn't see uh, HR, marketing, early childhood ed, and, and psych and barbering show up last month. So that's an interesting grouping to see this month, whereas the other ones we've seen for several months now. So that's Google search volumes. Now we're going to look at enrollment volumes. And last month we covered new student enrollments in this section. Today, we're going to look at total enrollment. So it, it will look somewhat similar, though the, the really the biggest change is the growth in associates is a year behind in that, it, you know, being tier programs, we're seeing last year we were down 1% versus uh, the new student enrollments were up slightly. Now we're seeing new student or total student enrollments are up 2% for associates degrees in 2023-24 compared to the prior year. So Finally, after several years of uh, downward uh, trend, 2%, then 8 then 7 down to 1 we're finally seeing some growth in the associate's degrees. Uh, and then on the certificate side, we can see that the growth is continuing. We were up 5% last year in terms of total enrollment that we saw in the National Student Clearinghouse data. Now it's a 6% increase this year compared to the prior year. So... These are certainly good signs. Again, um, you know, some of this could be due to the free 
um, college initiatives in states over the past year plus. Um, but certainly these are, are, are good trends to see. Uh, and we'll hope these continue as we, we update this data through the current year. Though, again, some of the institutions we've spoken with are this fall 2024 enrollments have, have been up. So um, we'll, we'll obviously have to wait and see, but this is, you know, gives you some sense of what the trend has been at this particular degree level over the past several years now. In terms of the, the programs growing the most in terms of total enrollment, this is showing the, the five-year unit change, uh, so the total volume change in enrollments for the top 10 programs or the 10 fastest growing programs in the U.S. And again, we've bucketed them into CTE being the career and technical education programs, got four of those, and then three health and three business and tech. And again, this list is somewhat similar to the certificates that we showed last month in the new student enrollment volumes. But now you can see just in terms of the, the raw or total number of students enrolled in programs, where they rank in terms of fastest growing. And we've got welding uh, at the top of the list, then some other trades programs in electrician, uh, auto body slash collision repair tech and auto mechanics tech. Then for healthcare programs, we've got health information, medical records, LPN, and medical billing and coding. And finally, uh, for the others, we've got in an information technology program, cybersecurity, which I, I think might have been towards, or if not one, maybe two on our new enrollments last that we showed last month. And finally, business administration management. So a pretty wide range of, um, in terms of type of program. You know, we're not seeing just, for example, programs in data science or AI, which certainly we'll see in some of the other charts as we get through this presentation in terms of fast growing and emerging, emerging areas. And then in terms of the, uh, that was certificate and sorry, in terms of the associate's degrees, uh, this is actually what I think what I was thinking of too, and that we do see cyber here at, at the top of the list uh, in, in regards to the total enrollment change over the past five years. So follow closely by very close uh, allied health slash health services. But again, we can see that there's roughly, we've got four tech programs, four health related, and then a couple others. Um, and so rounding out the, the tech programs, we do have computer science, information technology, and data analytics. And then for health, we've got diagnostic medical sonography, radiographer and community health and preventative medicine, and finally psychology and economics. So again, some, some programs that probably aren't surprises, like I was mentioning, cybersecurity, computer science, maybe, um, but then just some other large programs that, you know, have been around for a while and are continuing to see an uptick in student enrollment volumes over the past five years. Next up, uh, just briefly to round out student demand, I'll touch on the course era information that we track. And these obviously are not full-blown programs as we think about a certificate or an associate's degree, um, but this does provide you with some uh, useful information in regards to what are, are you know, what could be perspe uh, prospective students looking for in regards to the types of, of learning uh, that exists out there. Uh, in this case, it's, it's courses, but again, this should help provide you with information on what should we be teaching maybe within some of the programs that we're offering based on what those potential learners are looking for. And here we see a lot of, in terms of the fastest growing courses in October, year over year, seven out of the 10 are technology related courses from foundations, data, data everywhere, to AI for everyone, uh, user, so UX design, technical support, Python, data science, and intro to AI. So uh, a lot to do with AI and just uh, tech-focused courses in general. And then there are certainly some others that uh, includes, you know, projects, uh, starting a successful project, intro to psych, and learning how to learn um, powerful mental tools. So it is uh, certainly an interesting list. It's not quite, I mean, I 
recall looking at this in the past and seeing uh, far more sort of, I'd say, you know, personal fulfillment, um, more so than tech in the past. But here we're now seeing a lot more tech focused courses that uh, students are looking for. And then in terms of the specific skills that are taught, again, not surprising, similar in terms of the type in that now eight out of 10 are technology focused. And then we do have, uh, I mean, you could argue spreadsheet as a skill might, uh, you know, it's kind of a hybrid. Um, and then project management being the two others. But uh, again, a list of data analysis, visualization, SQL, Python, data science, data cleansing, machine learning, deep learning, several um, unsurprising topics or skills, I would say, based on what we're hearing in the industry today and the just the um, the vast improvements and uh, an AI that is making it much more available, I think is driving a lot more people to want to learn. Uh, you know, we saw on the prior screen, what is artificial intelligence, but then also how, how can I work with it and potentially build my own models and so on. Next up, we'll now touch on employment. So here we'll be looking at job postings trends for the, the job postings that we track. Uh, and getting into, again, just similar to the student demand, what what pops out uh, in the most recent month or, you know, recent past three months for some of these charts. And firstly, before I do dive into the results, uh, it is really important to highlight, uh, and this is something we've spent a lot of time on over uh, the many years I've been at Grade DI and longer, uh, and that is how programs map to job opportunities, in particular, how SIP codes, the classification of instructional programs from IPEDS, map to the standard occupational or SOC codes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And uh, there's, there's a crosswalk that exists from NCES that does map direct prep occupations. And here we're highlighting an example where we're looking at communications, the communications program. And the NCES crosswalk would tell us that students in this particular program, uh, they are prepared for nine occupations. And so they map to the nine occupations you see on the left side of the page here in this table from broadcast announcers to communication teachers, editors, fundraisers, uh, down to public relations managers and specialists and writers and authors. And off to the right, we show what the job postings year to date look like in those fields with most of them coming from the public relations specialist SOC code. And I mean, we look at this information and it's very misleading in that communications majors can or graduates can go on to do a lot more than these nine professions. And so that's where we've... Uh, brought in this data set that shares alumni, or we now track alumni career profile data, in this case, for this particular program on over 60,000 graduates. And those 60,000 graduates go into 762 different occupations, which are a lot more than nine. And so it's really important to think about this as you're thinking about, or really looking at data on potential student outcomes in that there are a lot more job opportunities for graduates than just what the NCES crosswalk would suggest. And here we're showing the top 10 occupations in terms of top 10 in terms of occupations and job titles. But again, this list goes on another 752 beyond this. Um, these are just the top 10 looking at what communicator students who graduated with an associate in communication go on to do. And so we look at the list on the left in general and operations managers, advertising, promotion, marketing, project management, graphic designers, sales, marketing again. None of these were shown in the, the list we saw on the prior page. So, uh, you know, these these students are going on their graduates are moving on to do a lot more than what the, the government crosswalk would suggest they do. And so it's really important to as you're whether it be career counselors working with students 
and making sure you're identifying or those teams are identifying for students what their potential opportunities are. But then also when you're evaluating programs, it's important to make sure that you're also assessing the total number of job possibilities available for graduates and not just defining it as that small subset of direct prep. Now, in regards to, um, so this is really taking that data a step further and looking at the alumni uh, work profile data. And this highlights just what the top industries are for our graduates. So in terms of the, and the list on the left shouldn't be surprising, that word map uh, identifying what are the top 15 majors. And this is, we track this at the associates level. So what are the top 15 majors for associates graduates? You can see the list on the left here. Again, shouldn't be that out of line with your expectation in seeing business, nursing, general studies or liberal arts, computer science, and so on. But then the list to the right side of the page shows the, the top 15 industries, those all the graduates end up in. And so again, this just highlights where all those opportunities are in that it is healthcare, uh, retail, IT, not a surprising list. It is in line probably with the workforce of many of these. But again, this is just high level information where uh, the point of highlighting this is there's obviously a lot more detail where you can go in and see for your programs in your markets where these students are, are ending up to the point of even drilling down to a specific program like we have here and looking at the uh, bookkeeping at the associates level uh, and seeing for folks who graduate in that particular field where they end up in terms of industry and even more specific where they end up in terms of the, the, the companies that uh, hire these individuals. So there's uh, a great deal of information that uh, again, thinking back to the overall program evaluation system, these are some of the deep dives you can get into on outcomes for a particular program that may help identify potential future opportunities or businesses to work with, or even what we should be training. And that's where the what we should be training comes into the next section as we get into the skills. So... With that, I'm jumping into our now our job postings trends. And so here we're looking at the uh, total number of job postings uh, by month for similar to the, the student demand charts for the, the past several years. And here we can see that there was a, a pretty large uptick in October job postings. It grew, they grew 30% year over year compared to 2023. And it, it certainly seems uh, a bit off when you look at this. It, it, you know, it is a pretty large jump, but it is more in line with the months prior to September in terms of the volumes of job postings we'd been seeing in 2024. And so really the, the anomaly seems like September where there was a dip in job postings, but now we're seeing it's back up again, similar to where it was in August. And it was even higher in June and July um, and, uh, you know, similar heights and in terms of the volumes we were seeing from February to May as well. So um, there was certainly, a, I'd say, a little concern when we were looking at the information last month where it was flat year over year, but down pretty significantly. It's about a 20, 23 percent drop September, or from August to September. And now that's been recouped where we're seeing about a 20% increase from September to October in job postings volumes, which is a good sign. In terms of the uh, last month, we certainly, we spent some time looking at what was popping up year over year uh, in terms of just the fastest growing. Here we wanted to highlight some of the, and this month we wanted to highlight some of the job postings or I should say programs with the highest volume of job postings. Um, and so this is where we're looking at for the past three months, the total volume of job postings in those three months from August to October. In here, we can see registered nursing at the top, retail shown second, retail salespersons, general office occupations, nursing assistants, got computer user support specialists, home health and personal care, admin assistants, customer service reps, LPN, and heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers. So uh, again, we've got some healthcare showing up on this list, like we've seen in many of the other charts. 
um, some computer user support. And these are filtering specifically for associates and certificate degrees uh, required. So it is giving you some sense of for students who are graduating with a certain or so what the the job volumes are or the really the highest opportunities are based on what is being posted online. And then looking at the uh, the job growth. So this is comparing, again, the trailing three months to uh, the year of year. So to the trailing or the same three months in 2023, we can see a similar list uh, at the top of the page here. You see the first uh, five shown here are also in the top 10 for volume that we saw on the prior page in the, uh, and again, not surprising in healthcare, we've got the nurses, nursing assistants, LPNs, uh, and truck drivers, but then not shown up in the largest, but in the fastest growing, we do have software developers, um, automotive service techs, cooks, medical assistants, and radiologic technologists. Lastly, on the job volumes, uh, and before we get into the, the final section for today, uh, is looking at the skills. So again, think of this as not necessarily uh, what you should be offering in regards to programs, but this is the type of data that will be useful in thinking about what we should be teaching within those programs. And also this might uh, spark some ideas in terms of some of the certain keywords that uh, should either be you know, in a program title or a concentration or um, marketed on the website as a part of the curriculum so that, um, again, prospective students are aware of what they'll be taught um, not necessarily just what the program's called. And so I know this isn't a new idea, but just uh, again, worth reminding. And uh, here we're looking at the highest skills volume. Uh, last month, we looked at the similar to the jobs, we looked at the fastest growing skills. Here we wanted to highlight what ones are still showing up in terms of the highest number of volumes. And that's because when you look at fastest growing, there certainly are a, a lot of tech related um skills that show up in that list. But it's really important to remember what's truly big and still in demand. And that's what this list provides you in that uh, medical office products, whether it be Excel or office in general, uh, tend to always show up in, in job postings. So not surprising at the top of the list. Um, but again, it's, you know, they've, it's kind of always been there. So you might not see that show up much in fastest growing. Uh, and then there are some others. Uh, we've got several health related ones in terms of mental and behavioral health, nursing care, rehab, um, which is, again, still a huge field and obviously skills needed there. And then we've got others outside of that in accounting. Uh, I skipped registration and construction, billing and project management. So um, again, this is really providing you with a list of what's still in great demand, albeit maybe not growing like some of those other fields are, but still in existence today. So next up, uh, and, and that covers our, our really our trends in, in the uh, student demand and employment uh, of really the associates and certificates volumes from through October. Now for our, our special section, as I'm calling it, we'll get into our, our emerging programs. And it says, where are they now? And that I'm going to share with you uh, some, some updates on programs we've featured in the past. And I'll, I'll share this at the end, but since uh, Mary Ann's put it in the chat, this is all in reference to our five emerging programs webinar that we uh, we offer and post every January. And we've been doing this for, I think, more than five years now. Um, and so she's posted a link in the chat to register for the upcoming one in January of 2025, where we'll feature five new programs. And so uh, that's really what uh, this highlights here as well, in that uh, it identifies five programs that we've been keeping track of. And so we're, we're looking for programs that consider new innovations and fields of research that are starting to emerge as potential focus areas. Uh, and really the purpose for this is that there is a great deal of programs emerging that don't exist in the data that we track yet. 
especially the data within a program evaluation system where it's reliant on uh, SIP codes already having been created and obviously then the data being stored in those SIP codes. So we track these programs across really three uh, stages of categories and that's early stage where we're starting to see a small number of programs being developed and launched, but it's not currently widespread. Uh, and these might sometimes represent niche opportunities um, or leverage particular strengths or capabilities of an institution, um, such as and some programs that we featured in the past. Examples are esports or cannabis related programs. Our next stage would be forming, where there are programs that are beginning to form or maybe launching in the near future, um, but are often underpinned by technologies or innovations that are nearing sort of proof of concept or scaling to reach the, the broader community. So um, we'll share, uh, there's an example I think we have of one of those in here. And then there's speculative, um, where there are programs that address emergent technologies or research uh, that is, are in very early stages of development. Uh, and they may have the potential to be highly disruptive, but are still very much unproven. So an example of one of these that I think we covered in a past webinar was uh, smart plants uh, or the internet of plants. And another one was the hydrogen economy. And so both of these really yet to sort of reach full scale commercial viability. Um, but take hydrogen, for example, as it, you know, if and when it becomes a more sort of widespread source of clean and inexpensive energy, it, it could certainly be a game changer and lead to, um, lead to some programs in higher ed, but certainly all sorts of changes. The other thing to consider in, in this list I'll share with you today, and especially as you attend the future webinar, um, is that this is really meant to spark ideas um, and highlight some emerging technologies that maybe you're not familiar with, but are certainly worth thinking about as you're thinking of new programs that you may launch in, it could be, you know, three to five years. Uh, and in some cases, in terms of the, the programs we share, it might change how you offer a program in regards to, especially on the technology side, some of the technologies that exist uh, in terms of how you're able to offer a program. Think, you know, like virtual reality, uh, something we shared a, a while back, uh, where it might be a program, but it, it might be how you teach a program. Not saying you will, but it's, it's something to it really just spark ideas. Um, but then things to consider are really the timing. And uh, this is important as you think about your, your school in general. And has the field emerged enough um, are you comfortable with being sort of one of the early folks in a particular field? There's something to be said where if other institutions are already offering it and driving demand up. That certainly can make it a lot easier than having to, to build out your own demand if it's a you know, first of its kind type of program where it requires a much heavier uplift in terms of marketing because you're, um, you're doing this for the first time. So that's something to think about. Um, size, is it likely to be big enough to support growth at the institution? Uh, mission, again, we talked about this, but does it fit with the uh, mission of the institution? Degree fit, does it, uh, you know, is this particular subject area or field, whatever it may be, does it fit with an associate's or certificate degree? Um, you know, is there something we can offer in that area at that level is really important. The difficulty and obviously how difficult it would be to develop the curriculum to, um, you know, find expertise in a particular field, especially as you're thinking, I mean, these are emerging fields, there aren't that many folks out there who can potentially train. So that's something you have to think about, which then leads also to funding and how much would it cost to hire those, those types of faculty. Uh, and also what other resources or capital costs would be involved in launching the program. So there's a, a lot obviously to consider, but uh, much of this is, is really meant to, to spark ideas and kind of have you thinking about what might be to come uh, in the future. And so today I won't spend a whole lot of time on these just based on the time we have left in today's webinar, 
but there are five programs that we wanted to share with you um, to take a look back uh, on these in which we've hi highlighted in past years webinars. Um, and so looking at what, what's changed or what has happened in some of these fields. Uh, so we've got applied AI, disinformation intelligence, creator economy, space commercialization, and cellular agriculture. Uh, so these we'll walk through in, in more detail. A couple we didn't include that uh, are worth mentioning are, are, we spoke about generative or creative AI, uh, I think three or four years ago now, back in January of 22, I think is when we covered that as a technology and a potential program area. And, you know, I, I mentioned this because it, it highlights some of the fields that we do bring up. And I think we can now say that this is come to fruition. Um, and uh, I mean, is all you hear about in terms of chat GPT and Gemini and some of the other um, software out there that, you know, allows you to have a lot more information at your fingertips just by typing it into a search bar. So I think that's one, again, as an example that we covered in the past several years ago that is now here. And another one is uh, cannabis related programs where we identified that as a program opportunity five years ago, almost five years ago. And as uh, again, for some institutions provided some, some strong programs in terms of the size um, and some examples are related to the business of cannabis and uh, chemistry related. And then obviously there's the um, medicinal use, uses that are finding their way into programs. So now let me jump through just again, quickly covering some of these uh, topics that we've covered in the past. First one is applied AI, where I, we talked about this one last year. And we're beginning to see more and more interdisciplinary programs and courses like applied AI and business being added to institutions uh, within their, in this case, in their business programs. And so there's been a number of uh, program launches or programs that are have been in existence even this uh, before this year that many institutions are are launching in regards to. Uh, adding AI to other programs already being offered at the institution, really. So there's AI in business. We've seen uh, BA in digital art and artificial intelligence. Uh, DePaul has an AI in marketing certificate. There's um, some other, I mean, this would be, you know, above the community college level, but Northeastern has a master's in advanced in uh, and intelligence manufacturing. Cedars Sinai has a PhD in health artificial intelligence. Um, we've got Fitchburg State with an AI and database communication strategy graduate certificate. And then some others specifically called Miami Dade, for example, offers an applied AI and associates and a bachelor's degree. So this is one that uh, we're beginning or have have begun to see several programs being launched in applied AI. Next, we have disinformation intelligence. Um, this all stems from the, you know, the alternative facts and fake news that were becoming part of our vocabulary um, about four years ago, uh, five years ago when we, I, we covered this in January of 2021 as a, an emerging program area um, based on some of those terms that were beginning to pop up. And uh, it was all designed to obviously tell, be able to tell fact from fiction in a world where anyone and everyone can create content uh, and, and it's easily digested in all the forms of social media that exist today, um, unlike, you know, many years ago when it was uh, all in, on paper. So um, uh, it was earlier this year that Inside Higher Ed reported that a growing number of institutions now include courses in digital and media literacy as a, as a requirement now for graduation. So uh, this was, again, one we covered four years ago um, that, you know, are, are really have emerged, I would say, in terms of the um, how we would classify this program. And you can see a, a quote here in terms of just the the level of 
Um, this is from Technopedia publishing that uh, fake local news sites now outnumber legitimate newspapers. So this is, uh, you know, even more exaggerated with artificial intelligence and how easy it is to create disinformation. Um, and so it's, 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 you know, become a bit of a problem. And there's, I mean, it's not just text that this AI creates, but I'm sure many of you have seen some of the videos that you can now create of um, deep fakes of, of people, you know, quoting uh, or in interviews, right, that don't exist on making up quotes. So um, we've also seen a, you know, some new programs or programs have been launched since we did the webinar on this one or covered this in the webinar where we've got Arizona State University offering a digital media literacy bachelor's. Uh, Swarthmore, Swarthmore is develop, uh, college is developing a program right now uh, in disinformation studies. And then American Public University offers a graduate nano certificate in open source intelligence. So we haven't seen a ton of programs being launched, but there are certainly some that are popping up uh, and it's, you know, beginning to develop to develop as an area. Next, and this segues perfectly from the disinformation and the mention of social media is the creator economy, which we talked about in our 2023 webinar. So almost two years ago, uh, as a sort of a new type of uh, economic engine that was built around individual creators and social media influencers. So this is one that I'm sure you and, uh, you know, all of your students are familiar with it. Uh, and may even be creators themselves in that uh, it's it's really just hit social media and many, especially in the younger generation, this, you know, see this as a, a job. Um, and it's uh, according to reports, I think there was one by um, Goldman Sachs and uh, several others just estimating that more than $15 billion is uh the size of this industry and is forecast to grow more than 25% annually over the next six to seven years. So um, that's, I mean, creates a almost $80 billion industry uh, in terms of the creator economy. And it's, it obviously, you know, fits more than just thinking about creators specifically, right? The, um, the ones that are, you know, with millions of subscribers posting videos, but this does apply to other programs as well in terms of thinking about what's being taught as uh, we're seeing a lot more businesses now marketing on social media, well, pretty much all businesses now marketing in social media. So thinking about marketing programs uh, in general, or more specifically, you know, how to use social media, how to come up with ideas um, is really important in terms of even the type of curriculum that we're teaching within a marketing program, for example. And then in terms of programs that we've already seen launched, there's Owens Community College offers a media influencer certificate. Arkansas State University offers an undergraduate certificate in the NIL promotion, name, image, and likeness, which again is a, a huge growing, uh, I don't know what to refer to it as, but opportunity um, idea in terms of student athletes. And then uh, East Carolina University announced a partnership with Mr. Beast, one of the largest or the largest YouTube star for students who want to work with content creators. So there's uh, a number of new programs and there were 10 new programs in 2024 alone that were launched um, across the different degrees, concentrations or certificates. Next up, we've got space commercialization, where we covered this uh, a few years ago. Um, the idea of commercials, uh, a commercial space economy. So um, it, you know, has become more popular, I'd say, in in recent uh, news with SpaceX. But it's uh, this is the idea of kind of space tourism and commercialization. Uh, and this becoming a reality. And so we've seen colleges and universities starting to launch programs that address a variety of the opportunities in this area. Um, so, and you can see sort of some of the examples on the, the page here, just highlighting 
what, you know, what some of the things that could be taught maybe are from asteroid mining to space investing, space tourism, and so on. Um, but some examples of programs that are, you know, worth looking up if you're, you're curious would be the Colorado School of Mines offers a space resources program focused on extraterrestrial mining and extraction. ASU has an executive ed program on space leadership, business, and policy. Uh, Athens State University launched a bachelor's in aerospace systems management. Cornell has a, a space flight mechanics certificate program for engineers. So there's, you know, these are just some examples and there are plenty of, I'm sure, new types of programs that are going to pop up as uh, space exploration uh, emerges more and more. And then finally, last program before I summarize is cellular agriculture. And this admittedly is still emerging. Uh, and, you know, is still, uh, this we'd classify in, uh, if you recall at the beginning, it, more in this speculative phase uh, in terms of those three stages uh, I talked about at the beginning, where this is the, the farming of agricultural products from cells rather than animals. And so, there's certainly still a huge hurdle to to get over in terms of just the public opinion of this, um, you know, eating meals or meat that are made from cells in labs rather than the animals themselves like chicken or beef. So that's uh, certainly a hurdle to get over. And then there's um, the hurdle of the cost in that it's it's not quite or nearly as cost effective at this point um to to create this food um essentially so um there are certainly some research programs that exist at tufts purdue harvard uc davis in cellular agriculture but um again those are you know think more research oriented graduate level um so it'll be interesting to kind of keep track of this one in terms of the phase it's at now to see what opportunities arise that maybe the certificate and associates level in uh, in the future as this either does or doesn't emerge more. So that's, again, just sort of a, a little update on some of the programs from the past. And oh, hopefully this gives you some ideas for things we've covered that maybe you weren't familiar with. Um, but, uh, again, gives you some sense of what we'll be covering this year when we highlight five new emerging programs that, uh, we'll cover for the beginning of 2025. And again, should give you some opportunities to think about what, you know, maybe you're not thinking about today for new program ideas. So to summarize, uh, in October, Google searches for academic programs rose pretty significantly. Uh, over almost 60%, over 60% year over year with business administration and management grew over 400,000, uh, an average cost per click, unfortunately did rise, uh, 9% year over year total student enrollment in certificate programs is up 6% and associates degrees is up 2%, which is a great sign. Then in 23, 24, we saw welding, uh, tech and cybersecurity with the highest growth, uh, from five years ago, associates and communication grads, we did highlight this, and this is true for many associates degrees in particular, but they go into 762 occupations, not nine, uh, which uh, is uh, something to think about and, and really remember as you're evaluating programs that there are far more opportunities. Uh, we saw registered nurses, not surprising, a big field has the highest job postings volumes and growth. Then we did see there's still high demand for many skills that aren't quite the fastest growing, like the ones we're seeing in, in AI and other software related products, but there's still high demand for things like Microsoft Office uh, and many of the healthcare skills that were shown on that page. And then finally, as a reminder, we covered our sort of update for this month uh, remember to tune in next month or sorry, in two months now, um, when we, we cover our five emerging programs, uh, for the 2025 year.
And Marianne did post that link in the chat. So please feel free to go ahead and, and sign up through that. Or you can go to our website at gradei.us and click on our upcoming events tab shown at the top of the page. That'll, that'll take you to not only that webinar for the emerging programs, but also uh, is where you can subscribe to future, webinar, future webinars for this particular series uh, for community colleges, where we'll be hosting our next one on December 18th at 2 p.m. So uh, please feel free to do that. And uh, we're always happy to chat. If you have any questions about the data I shared today or want to dive deep into some of the programs I covered uh, in our data sets, we're always happy to do so. So please don't hesitate to reach out. With that, uh, I thank you all for coming. And uh, I will uh, let you all go and have a great Thanksgiving holiday.